Hello friends, my name is Shivam from DevOps Schools and I will help you to enable your learning process in various technologies of DevOps, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data and many more. This is our initiative to help you by sharing multiple tutorials and videos. And if you want any specific tutorials or any particular topic, then please do comment in the below comment section and I will help you with it. Also, please subscribe to our premium services on YouTube, which will give you access to more content and videos to enhance your knowledge about all these topics. Also, if you want me to help you with regards to the online trainings and classroom sessions by our qualified trainers, then do please do write me at uh, contact at devopsschool.com. Okay, so the, today's agenda would be the introduction to you, introduction, introducing you to the uh, Docker Certified Associate uh, Certification Training Course uh, from DevOps School. And uh, this course goes for uh, 10 to 15 hours of duration uh, with uh, hands on. Okay, and uh, yeah, the agenda for this session would be like explaining you what exactly Docker is all about and why people are, uh, you know, behind uh, this uh, particular uh, specific tool why organizations are rapidly migrating from uh, monolithic application structures to, uh, you know, microservices, uh, which is, uh, again, uh, a different approach. Okay. So basically to understand Docker itself. Okay. So it was introduced in 2013 and from that uh, particular year, it has been spreading a lot along organizations uh, that many of the organizations have already been migrating their projects from or uh, containerizing their applications uh, using Docker. Okay. And uh, so this particularly <coughs> how it become and what exactly the docker is all about and uh, what exactly the container to understand this particular process you must have a basic knowledge about how a proper machine works okay so how a regular machine works so what is its uh, you know architecture so basically uh, let me put it this way so, so consider this as your machine okay or if you're uh, having your laptop okay so basically there are multiple components that consist within your uh, particular machine that would be your hardware which we can call as hardware or infrastructure then we have your os that is your operating system it can be anything irrespective of uh, uh, windows linux or ubuntu it can be anything and upon of, of your operating system, you have your applications or you have your user data and you run your applications upon your operating systems. That's how a basic architecture works. Okay. So now if you need to have a multiple or uh, multiple operating systems to be executed within guys, am I audible, clear and loud? Yes, yes, yes. 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 So if there is any disturbance, please let me know. Or if you're not able to hear my voice, also let me know. Okay. Sure. So uh, now take, let us take a scenario that myself, I'm working on a particular application. Okay. I'm a developer and I'm working on a particular application that uh, particularly runs only on a specific kind of operating system right now. Okay. At the design stage. And right now, I have only uh, one particular operating system that is running as Windows. Okay. So, but my application that I'm designing is for Linux based operating systems. Okay. Now consider this scenario. If I'm a student, okay, who is working on this particular process or scenario, basically I have a Windows machine. Obviously I would look out for my friends who have a Linux machine or Ubuntu machine for time being, I would borrow it and I would learn. If I do not have that, Okay, if I do not have any of my friends uh, in my college or nobody is having a Linux machine, obviously I would request my parents if I'm not uh, <laughs> you know, dependent, then I would request my parents and I would take the approval and I would get some funds and then I would uh, go to a nearby, uh, uh, you know, store, uh, uh, computer store and I would like to upgrade my machine to the uh, Linux operating systems. But you're forgetting one particular point over here. <laughs> okay. So at any point of time, you can run only one particular OS on your particular hardware. That is your uh, uh, CPU, uh, anything it can be. Okay. So if this is the case, okay. So how can that be resolved? How can we run multiple operating systems? Imagine that take the same scenario onto the organization level. On the organization level, it works entirely different. Okay. So a new project is coming up and you need to set up a new infrastructure. There would be a lot of people involved. Okay. There would be a lot of requests, right? and that request go to your procurement team and your procurement team raise a request to your uh, hardware vendor and then if your hardware vendor have them in place then he would 
get it otherwise he would place a order to the manufacturer itself okay this is how the chains goes okay but imagine if this is the uh, case of we are talking about hundreds of servers then imagine how much time it would take how many people would include how many approvals or how many requests should be raised and uh, you know get the things into the place okay so again the same problem uh, the main problem over here what what how can we resolve at any point of time we are we are able to run only one particular operating system uh, on the hardware okay that's when in olden days uh, there came another process called dual boot process okay so if you have heard about this dual boot process where you can install two operating systems on your hardware so that at the boot time you can select which operating system can execute okay So here at the boot time, uh, once you have installed two different operating systems in the process of dual boot, both the operating systems would be installed on your hardware. And at the time of boot, okay, you can select which operating system that you want to execute. If you want to go for Linux operating system, then you select Linux. If you want to go with Windows, then you can select Windows or any other operating system. Okay, but again, there is a uh, you know drawback over here. Again, as a main point, at any point of time, you are able to run only one operating system, either Windows or Linux. Okay, applications that you are working on uh, uh, <coughs> Linux that would be isolated to the Linux operating system itself. And if you have any applications that are running, okay, that will be isolated to the Windows operating system itself. Okay, now how come you uh, overcome this particular uh, you know problem that or uh, what is uh, exactly the resolution that you can uh, get it? To resolve this particular issue okay that's where your hypervisors okay or uh, hypervise <coughs> virtualization methods came into picture so what exactly a virtualization is about or how it, it can be achieved virtualization is nothing but okay creating a virtual or logical servers upon your physical hardware or physical host machines okay which means that there is a piece of uh, software that will allow you to create a logical or virtual which means that they are not physically present but the functionality of them would be it can be utilized so that's where the virtualization methods came into picture so what the virtualization methods allows you to the traditional uh, dual board processes is that you the structure would be the same hey viewers our Master in DevOps Engineering program can help you to hone the skills necessary to succeed in high-level DevOps positions. So what are you waiting for? Enroll now and earn certification that show you are keeping pace with today's technical roles and requirements. Contact info is mentioned in the video sidebars and in the description box. Book your seats for the upcoming batches now. You'll have your own hardware. And upon hardware, you'll have your operating system. And upon operating system, you will have the hypervisors or the virtualization tools. Okay. And how this hypervisors or this particular tools will allow you is that you can spin up. Okay a logical or virtual operating system using the hypervisors okay the hypervisors are nothing but that will allow you to spin up a physical or virtual or a logical operating system okay so this way you can create n number of uh, you know operating systems that you can access uh, when in this particular method where uh, the operating systems are isolated but here you do have option okay to work with your oper uh, virtual servers along with you can also work with your host operating system so parallelly both will be accessible to you and uh, you can you know make things work between them the communication also can happen you can uh, to and fro transfer files you can uh, to and fro uh, make applications to communicate with each other that are running so that was possible due to hypervisor so this particular hypervisors are nothing but your uh, vmware okay uh, oracle virtual boxes these are the piece of software that will allow you to create uh, you know virtual or logical servers one question or uh, one particular problem that we face in this kind of uh, process is that okay utilization of the resources okay say example i have around 4 gb of ram okay i have around 4 gb of ram 
that is associated with this base operating system i mean base hardware or the physical machine that i have now if i want to spin up remember that if you want to run any operating system the first point is that you need to have a certain resources that will be allocated to the operating system and without that resources the operating system will not run so the all the hardware components that are required or mandatory is that your input output devices like your keyboard mouse and then your processors your memory your storage okay your networking all these components are formed or we can call them as hardware without these particular components you cannot install any operating system and you cannot run them okay so basically for any operating system the hardware components are mandatory and especially taking up uh, one component the memory itself i have around 4 gb of ram okay now if i consider this as a full operating system yes it is a full operating system to run this particular operating system obviously i need the hardware resources to be allocated to them with the help of hypervisors okay so now say example i'm allocating around 2 gb of uh, ram out of 4 gb to this particular virtual machine that i've created now imagine i am I'm trying to create another virtual machine where obviously I need to allocate some memory to it. Okay. Now, if I'm allocating another memory of another 2 GB of RAM to this particular machine, okay. So obviously, what would happen? Anyone can answer me. So I have around 4 GB of RAM. I have allocated 2 GB for this Linux machine and I have allocated another 2 GB for this particular Linux machine. So what would happen as soon as I spin up this particular virtual machine? Anyone? Uh, I think it would not work because the uh, system would also need some memory. Uh, yeah, exactly. So of, as soon as I've, I know I uh, spin up this particular virtual uh, server, the system goes, uh, I mean, the system will crash. The reason is that the resources that I have, whatever I have has been allocated over here and here, but there are no any resources to run the base operating system itself. Okay. So obviously the system would crash and this is where the blocker is with the hypervisor. So obviously you need to increase your resources. Okay. You need to increase your resources so that you can start working on this particular uh, uh, virtual servers. Okay. So you solved one particular problem over here and you ended up with another problem over here. Okay. So what would be the solution? So one particular solution is, of course, we can increase our resources and we can you know, limit this particular uh, utilization of the resources for the, on the base operating system. OK, but we need a particular uh, method OK, or we need a particular uh, permanent solution for this particular process. And one more thing OK, over here is that with the utilization of the resources, there comes a clear picture with uh, when multiple developers are working with multiple missions. OK, so obviously the collaboration of developers would be there at the end of the day and uh, the code that they're writing on both the sides. OK, will lead to a particular function or will lead to a particular uh, you know, process where pointing at each other that one developer is saying that, yes, this particular code is working on my mission and the other developer is saying that this is not working on my mission. OK, so basically it depends on multiple uh, you know, things like maybe your hardware, it may be your operating system, it Maybe the other tools that support or the IDEs that you are working. So <laughs> to put an uh, you know end to this particular method, the introduction of uh, you know Docker or containerization have come into picture. Okay. So how does this uh, remove this particular uh, you know drawback that we are seeing over here? That is utilization of the resources as well as the pointing fingers of developers like how it is working on my mission and it is not working on the other developer mission okay so the architecture is pretty straightforward like how we are seeing over here so same similarly we have our uh, you know hardware and we'll have your operating system itself and once you have this okay upon uh, operating system you'll have a docker installed okay so we get docker installed which is an open source tool or we can say docker engine okay so once you have this docker installed and you have a docker engine configured onto your base operating system similarly like how you have created a logical or virtual servers you can create the full operating system uh, using the docker engine in the form of containers okay so again, the containers are nothing but they have a full functionality of how a live operating system or a full operating system works. But only thing is that the resources, how they manage. OK, they have whenever you spin up a container, they'll only have libraries and binaries. OK, 
they'll not have much more than that okay that is the reason containers are very lightweight they're easy to create easy to destroy and easy to work with okay now you, you may ask me one particular question how come when they have only two components that are libraries and binaries but still yet they're able to provide you the full functionality of an operating system okay that might be the question so here <clears throat> the answer would be whatever containers that you spin using a docker engine the resources that it requires it directly takes from the a base operating system okay it directly takes from the uh, base operating system whatever you're running using the kernel and other uh, functions that it require or resources that it require it basically takes from the base operating system and as soon as it finishes its work okay it can be destroyed auto easily so that the resources will be released easily okay that's how the mechanism works so here you need not require to specially allocate you know uh, uh, specific components like your ram memory something like that basically it is it is a very lightweight and it depends on the base operating system on the or the kernel itself okay and <coughs> it runs its architecture and gives you full functionality that is the reason it has become so popular so uh, utilization of the resources has been uh, you know eliminated now the second question pointing fingers at each other okay like it is working on my mission it is not working on my mission so here they follow certain architecture okay so each and every container gets created out of an image okay so here image is nothing but okay it's a file that you can create or you can take from the community okay so wherever you run whatever operating system you run okay if you create a container out of this particular image it would be the same on any uh, operating system or any machine or any type of uh, you know uh, environment that you're working so you cannot say that this particular container is not working for me how it is working for you, you cannot say that okay basically it is being created from the image itself so the image is universal say example i am creating an image with uh, you know uh, java installed in it so whenever i create a container the container will have automatically java installed in it okay so if i pass this image to you and you spin up a container out of the image you cannot say that java is not working for me as i said it's a universal and the other problem has been solved that's how a docker and uh, you know <coughs> has become so popular and as i said creating containers working with the containers and utilizing the containers or uh, uh, you know uh, creating the con images and working with the images the networking everything is pretty straightforward and it is easier okay even if uh, the basic prerequisites to learn docker itself is that if you have enough knowledge how a particular machine works okay or uh, how operating uh, uh, you know the machines the hardware itself okay the hardware how the uh, operating system comes into picture how things work okay so before that you need to understand another architecture the OS itself okay so basically <coughs> So I have a question here, uh, like what are the prerequisites that we need to have before installing Docker? Like, for installing do Docker or a, to learn the Docker? For installing Docker, like do we need to have some RAM specifications? No, a minimum requirement of uh, 4 GB RAM would be fine to run uh, Docker. So if you have more than that, that would be better. So yeah, we have different methods for different operating systems. Okay, so you have a different process for installing Docker onto Windows, and uh, you have different method or different process installing Docker onto Linux or Ubuntu machines on Mac itself. So yeah, in the subsequent sessions, we'll see that. That would be our next stop. Once we understand Docker, uh, the next stop. Uh, so I have a different yeah. question. Uh, uh, let's say I have uh, the OS has 100 MB of memory, and I spin up uh, around 10 containers. So wouldn't a uh, container mm -hmm. crash in that scenario? Sorry, sorry, you have? Uh, let's say I have an OS with 100 MB of uh, memory and I spin up uh, 10 containers, each of 10 MB, uh, 10 MB uh, resource. Uh, wouldn't a uh, container crash in this case? No, you are not specifying how much uh, you know, memory that you are allocating to the container. Basically, you are not doing that. But yes, you do have that approach that you can allocate uh, a specific uh, memory or specific RAM to your container. But basically, whenever you spin up a container, you are not uh, you know, specifying any uh, particular uh, memory that you want to allocate to this particular container. Uh, yeah, but uh, let's say it ex exceeds that at, uh, like. The exceeds that value threshold value let's let's say each container is taking around 12 mb of uh, uh, memory and uh, so it sums up to like 120 uh, 120 mb so uh, uh, what wouldn't uh, container still like do crashing 
No, that's what I'm trying to tell you here while creating the container, you are not specifying how much memory that it should take. OK, and only at the time of execution, it can it will utilize the resources. OK, when they are not ex being executed, there is no point of taking the resources. You're not permanently allocating the resources, even if that the execution of container, it may take some resources. As soon as it goes live, it will release the uh, resources that it has allocated to itself. Hey, viewers. Trying to get into DevSecOps? Enroll for our DevSecOps certified professional programs and earn the certification that shows you are fit for these technical roles and requirements. Contact info is mentioned in the video sidebars and in the description box. Book your seats for the upcoming batches now. Okay. Okay. So this is the basic architecture that you need to understand. Okay, how a computer works or how a machine works. Either it may be uh, Windows, Linux, or any operating system that you, you are utilizing or you're working upon. Okay, so basically you have hardware. That's a common thing. And then you have your kernel and then you have your shell and then you have your applications. If you observe over here, okay. So the hardware component itself, we know that what are the basic hardware components, your input output devices, your RAM, your storage, okay, your network cards, all this stuff falls under hardware component, the physical parts, okay. And then upon hardware, you have your kernel and upon kernel, you have your shell, upon your shell, you have your applications. So basically what does kernel does, okay, you need to understand that. So kernel, what it does is it converts okay the human understandable language into machine understandable language that are binaries zeros and ones you might heard about it okay so that's what kernel does and how does kernel uh, gets its information how does you know the kernel uh, gets its uh, you know triggers that it want to convert something to human understandable language to machine understandable language and then vice versa okay the machine understandable language to uh, human understandable language that's where your shell comes into picture your shell is nothing but an interactive tool that you execute upon kernel to do some functions okay so if i want to print something i say print and then the command will be sent to your kernel and kernel will convert that into binaries and your hardware will understand that and it gives you a proper response and then that it gets print out in the form of shell and upon shell you'll have your applications this is the basic architecture now you may ask me like where is the operating system over here okay the operating system is nothing but the combination of your shell and kernel forms the operating system either it may be linux or it may be uh, unix or windows or mac os or anything both the shell and kernel forms your operating system especially if you're talking about windows here you have the gui that is the reason you will not be able to identify which is shell which is kernel and that is the reason you have gui if you are working with linux okay whatever uh, shell commands that you execute okay we have different types of shells like uh, you know corn shell born again b shell likewise we have t shell likewise we have so many shells available to you with its functionalities and it would be clearly uh, understandable in linux while you're executing the commands that you're using shell to execute a command that will be passed to kernel and kernel to hardware and you get your output from hardware to kernel and kernel to your shell outputs okay and upon that you have your applications so this is the basic architecture of any uh, machines that you are working right now okay so if you understand this without any problem that you need not require to go or deep dive and understand the different layers of uh, hardware or different layers of kernel only the top layer how things work that would be more than sufficient to uh, learn you know dockers or to understand dockers okay and uh, if you elaborate how uh, you know uh, general uh, virtualization works and how uh, docker engine works so let me uh, you know put that in a diagram so that you could be clearly understandable just give me a minute let me finish the diagram
so the this is the basic uh, you know my <laughs> proud architecture that you get when you're using the hypervisors that is nothing but your virtualization me methods okay and also in virtualization methods you have uh, uh, you no know, two methods that is one is bare metal the other one is native or you know uh, so the bare metal is nothing but instead of uh, you know operating system you directly install your hypervisor on the hardware itself and then you run okay whereas in native methods you'll have your host operating system and then upon host operating system you'll have your hypervisor and then you have your guest operating system that will spin up over here and it will have libraries and binaries and then you have your applications okay similarly if you take this okay on to the uh, docker side you'll have uh, these three as common So this would be the architecture if you are using a Docker. Okay, so where you can have your uh, Docker engine created and then have uh, containers created like libraries, which contains libraries and binaries, and then you can run your applications. So this is how the architectures would differ if you are having, a, uh, you know, <coughs> a Docker and uh, you know, the methods itself. Okay, so basically you need to consider that uh, you know. Uh, it's a, a docker is not a virtual machine that you see over here or a hypervisor that you create okay and it's a, a you know which gives you containers and a docker containers like unlike your uh, virtual machines it does not require or include a separate operating system uh, instead it uh, you know depends on the <coughs> kernel's functionality and users uh, uh, resources from the uh, base operating system itself okay so that they can be isolated and execute okay so any queries to Liam? any questions no, sir. No. No. Okay, no. Thank you. Uh, Raju, I have one question. Uh, how Docker image is different from Docker container? <clears throat> so Docker image is different from Docker container. That's a good question, actually. So a container itself is the uh, runtime process that you are seeing whereas this particular runtime process will be created out of the image okay so to spin up any runtime in uh, runtime container you need the image itself so without the image specifications or without uh, the image you cannot run the container oh okay uh, thank you and as you mentioned let's say if we have an image of java or any software uh, mm -hmm. we, we do not need to we can just copy that image uh, again and again uh, and we we do not need to you know install it um, set up yes. it again yes yes again and again you need not require to download the image okay so basically it's a one time process once you download or once you pull the image from the registry which we have uh, you know private registry uh, we have private registries and public registries once you download any any image okay so that would be uh, you know permanently saved under your local okay so that next time when you try to run a container okay so basically how it works is first time when you're trying to run a container the docker engine will look for the image locally first okay if it does not find the image locally then it con uh, connects to the registry and then it downloads from the registry that's how it works and once it is downloaded then you need not require to uh, download each and every time that you spin up the container so it picks up from the local and then it executes the container itself from the image and you can create hundreds of hundreds of containers from the same image with a different name okay it is not that you can create only one particular container out of one particular image okay so you can create hundreds of containers from a single image itself hey viewers are you looking for formal training on sre practices Take our SRE program, this course will teach you how to successfully implement site reliability engineering in the modern day 24 into 7 services. Kickstart your SRE training today. Contact info is mentioned in the video sidebars and in the description box. Book your seats for the upcoming batches now. And okay. also, one important uh, thing is that, so you have two types of uh, images. One is, you know, community maintained images. The other one is custom images, which means that, 
let me show you. So the, this is the hub.docker.com is a, uh, you know, your uh, registry, public registry, similar to your, if you have worked with Git, how the repositories will be handled over this. Similarly, you can, you know, keep your images over here so that you can download any type. Okay, so let me search for, uh... so you could see over here, the Tomcat is the official image. This is maintained by from the Apache itself. Okay, like you have around 36,830 results. Okay, which means that all are not official, but you do have your community images that are official. And also you have your, uh, you know, um, community members, they have their own uh, images created, which means that basically there will be two types. One would be the community edition images and official images. The other one would be custom images. Custom images are nothing but you write your own images, okay? You write up your own images, customized images, so that you can spin up. I'll give you another scenario. Say example, I need to set up uh, a Jenkins, okay, which is a CI tool, okay? The prerequisites to install Jenkins is, I need to have Java installed into it, okay? So what I do is, I straight away, uh, you know, create or write an image file, okay? That from which operating system, the base operating system should be defined. And after that, which Java should I in, uh, install on the image and how the Jenkins should in, get installed. All these steps, all the configurations I'll write up in an image file and then I'll create the image or I'll build the image. So once I build the image, so that image would be my customized image. If I want to push it to you over here, the Docker Hub, yes, I can push it or I can keep it locally and after creating the image, if I'm spinning up a container out of that particular custom image that I've created previously, once the container has created and once you get into container, the, you can see that the Java is already installed and Jenkins is uh, you know, installed and it is running that you can access on this particular default port of 8080 that you can do that. So likewise, you have you do not have any limitations to customize your images. So there are a lot of lot of examples that we can discuss in subsequent sessions with multiple scenarios how customized images can help. Okay. So once the customized image has been created with multiple configurations, you you, you can share that particular image to hundreds and thousands of developers who are looking for the same configurations. So they need not require to time, spend time on writing the configurations or, or creating the images. They can simply use this image. They can download this image and they can create the container and whatever configurations are already been there then obviously there is no, no much not much time spent on writing the files itself or writing the images itself you already have handmade ready-made the image with the uh, specific uh, configurations that you are looking so that you can look uh, in the hub.docker.com over here not only for tomcat you can search for any specific applications that you are looking and once you search okay the search results will give you two options one would be the official images which you can use the other would be the custom images that multiple people have uh, you know worked upon or they configured the images with their specific configurations that's what the image is and of course yes <laughs> you will be learning a lot uh, how to write your own images and uh, once you write your how images how you can validate them and after validating them how you can uh, you know create build the images and once you have built the images how you can push to your docker hub so that people can uh, you know uh, share it or they can use it okay so any queries again um, no okay thank you <laughs> so coming to the course itself okay so what we'll be learning out of this particular course okay so basically today's was a course introduction session and the demo session which will be uh, you know couple of things we have discussed okay and after that we'll be seeing the installation and configuration how you can install docker on multiple operating systems either it may be a windows it may be ubuntu or it may be linux okay and how you can uh, you know install docker so that you can run uh, docker uh, commands okay basically how you can execute or how you can work with docker is that here you'll not have any gui okay basically you'll not have any gui it would be in the process of CLI, that is 
command line interface where you will be executing docker commands to uh, whatever functions that you want to do like creating the containers you know uh, checking the logs executing the containers or looking at the uh, logs that the containers have created or you want to enter into the container environment itself and then execute certain things all this stuff would be <coughs> done using a uh, docker commands itself that is for that uh, along with docker once you install there will be a proper tool called docker cli will be automatically installed with the package of docker itself okay so you will be uh, seeing how installations can happen on uh, windows uh, uh, linux and other operating systems in subsequent sessions and after that our stop would be working with the images itself as i said without or uh, an image you cannot create a container okay so basically image is the build uh, uh, base and building block for the containerization so without the images you cannot create any container of course you have uh, the community images that you can uh, use it okay there will be different layers that you need to understand inside the images okay and what would be uh, up to now we are speaking about creating the images creating the images and working with the images in the first place how will you create the image so that creation of process would be with the usage of a docker file okay so what exactly a docker file is how you write it how you compose it and how you make a different layers uh, layer by layer okay of the images will be discussed and once you get a clear picture on how the image uh, creation and management and registry how you can push it to your docker hub onto your account and how you can pull them and the later stages will be discussed and once it is done then we go for the orchestration so creating for the uh, containers okay so what exactly orchestration is nothing but so when you have a single container it is very easy for you to uh, you know monitor it or uh, work on it what if you have hundreds and hundreds of containers how do you uh, you know manage them that's where the orchestration comes into picture okay so the docker itself will have its own orchestration uh, component called docker spam okay so which have uh, good functionalities when uh, compared to kubernetes okay so on the other hand again kubernetes is nothing but an orchestration tool that work upon containers but here the community tool itself the in-house uh, you know tool itself that docker provides you is docker spam okay so how you can create clusters of containers how you can handle them how you can provide networking solutions how you can provide the communications between one container to the other container how you handle the storage of the containers how you put them in different namespaces likewise we define uh, or we learn multiple things under orchestration with the help of docker spam okay once we are done with docker spam then we see the storage and volumes okay so <laughs> how uh, the containers once once you create how do they get the storage okay so how do they get their uh, volumes or mount volumes or bind volumes likewise we have different methods of uh, attaching or if you have uh, uh, you know already a storage or or you have already a volume that has to be as uh, you now gets attached to a newly created container how you do it okay and in the first place how do you create your own volumes okay likewise we see a lot of stuff under storage and volumes okay and once we are done with storage and volumes then we step into the one of the important components networking okay so how do you establish uh, you know uh, communications between uh, the environment of uh, you know clusters or how do you establish communication that you want to access your container from the outside of your machine or outside of the docker engine or how do you expose your services that are running in the containers to the outside world say example i have uh, you know created a container and i'm running a website inside my container how can people from the outside networks can access to this particular container how do you map that communications from the container environment to the outside world all this stuff would be uh, you know uh, discussed under the networking section which is one of the important component again okay so at the end of the day once you have spinned up a lot of containers so those they are running locally on your machine or on your docker engine so how do you expose them to the outside world that's the important part that will be covered under the networking part and <laughs> once the networking is done the crucial one is your security how do you provide you know the security around your uh, containers okay so what exactly we have uh, by default what exactly docker engine security does okay and uh, how do you protect your docker daemon from http sockets okay and uh, <coughs> how you can create a docker content trust okay so these all those are layers of security that you provide one by one upon your containers that you're running your services okay and then we see a docker enterprise edition okay so what exactly the docker enterprise edition is how you can set up and what is the difference between community edition and enterprise edition and uh, 
<laughs> other stuff will be discussed uh, okay basically the enterprise editions will be uh, you know used under organizations uh, the community editions can be used for learning and other processes okay and finally we wrap up the session so hardly it would take us 10 to 15 hour sessions to cover all this stuff okay and also you can have a definition over here so what exactly a docker is okay so docker is so popular today that it has become the synonymous of container technology Docker has introduced and settled the industry standard for containers and fixed this. It works on my mission headache for millions of developers worldwide. It empowers developers to easily pick, ship, and run any applications as a lightweight, portable, self-sufficient container which can run virtually anywhere. As I said, the two drawbacks that we have on virtualizations, okay, one was resource utilization the other one was it works on my mission it does not work on the other developer mission that has been permanently eliminated because every container that you spin up is dependent on an image so if one image is creating a container in one particular mission successfully it is supposed to get created successfully in any other machine using the same image okay and what exactly a container again in the devops software development process containers is a solution to one of the crucial traditional problem of how to get software to run reliably when moved from one computing environment to other it has it helps us to build test deploy and redeploy applications on multiple environments from local mission to on premises data center and in private or public clouds as well so which means that whenever you are trying to migrate your applications okay from a monolithic designs to microservices design. Obviously, containerizing your applications is crucial, and this container method using Docker will help you a lot and moves the faster. Okay, so basically, in DevOps side, the DevOps also itself is introduced as a process of uh, you know uh, failing quick and fixing quick, so that you can make sure that releases would be easier. Okay, so that can be achieved this part using uh, the containers by creating from the uh, Docker. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, yeah i think uh, that would be the introduction session and uh, the general faqs we can see over here so what learning materials i would get from uh, or after this training okay so from the lms portal from devops school you have you'll have you know lifetime access to the recordings that we generally make and then uh, whatever pdfs that we use or whatever image files that we create will be uploaded into the lms you'll have <laughs> lifetime access to them okay and um, how do I become certified? So yeah, you must earn a passing score via proctored exam to earn a Docker certified associate level exam. Upon receiving your score, you'll receive your certification credentials through your email. Okay, and <coughs> what is the fee for uh, Docker examination? So the registration fee for the associate exam is 195 or uh, 175. Uh, home payment is good for one exam attempt okay so these are the general faqs okay so down the line we'll be seeing a lot of uh, questions that will be coming from your end okay so yeah that would be from my end so now you can ask me a QA sessions so any queries you have related to your uh, you know course uh, agenda what will be learning out of this 10 to 15 hour sessions or uh, any other queries you can ask thanks for watching want to study further Join our training programs today.